I'm not sure how inspiring raspberry soda is, but there you go. Um, Bryson leads with ending slavery, and I follow up with soft drinks. <laughs> um, but I'm really, I'm honored and excited to be here. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was on the phone with Jeff, kind of talking a bit about plywood and what it's all about. And I, I immediately started flipping through um, past workshops and uh, conferences that I've attended and kind of the notes that I had made there. And really quickly, something that stood out was that 95%, probably 99% of all like the really key points that I had written down, the ones I had circled and kind of starred beside them, 99% of them were just completely new to me. Like I didn't remember what they were. It's like I'd never seen them. Um, but something else that stood out is that a handful of them, like very few, had, had stuck with me since those conferences over the last year, two years, three years. Um, and not just in memory, but like something that I actually use every day and something that has really impacted Kinfolk and the way that we started the magazine and the way that we run it. So I've collected, kind of edited that down to share today, um, kind of the, the top eight of those lessons that stuck with me. But before diving into them, I'll kind of step back and explain a bit about Kinfolk, um, how we started, uh, what we're doing right now, and where we plan to go over the, the next year or so. So Kinfolk, Kinfolk is a quarterly entertaining magazine. And for anyone reading it for the first time, our subtitle really hints at the main purpose, which is discovering new things to cook, make, and do. So it's a place where artists, where writers, photographers, illustrators, where we get together and share ideas um, for small-scale entertaining. So the types of things that you do with family and friends, like cooking together, eating, uh, spending time outdoors. And we started the, the magazine with two main goals. The first was we wanted to offer an alternate idea of entertaining, um, not the traditional entertaining with uh, frilly napkins and, and all the fancy stuff, but something that felt casual, it felt meaningful, it felt intentional. And the second goal is we wanted that approach to entertaining. We wanted it to feel natural and accessible for a younger generation, um, kind of young adults like myself. At the time, we, we noticed a, a stereotype or kind of an assumption that young adults really just enjoy uh, bar hopping and clubbing and kind of hanging out, which to me sounds very, uh, sounds very unintentional. And that maybe the idea of actually inviting friends over into your home and like actually cooking with them and sitting around a table, that that was just for the old folks and it was a bit, bit stiff and too formal and you know, overly domestic, which we really didn't think was the case. So we decided to, to start work, working on it with just uh, a couple of my friends, actually, in our last year of university. Um, so that's me up in the top, my wife, actually, uh, and just an example of kind of how frugal we were. Apparently, we couldn't afford a step ladder to get that shot, so they're <laughs> up on their shoulders. Um, and at the time, it was just what we enjoyed doing. Like, we enjoyed cooking together, um, and it came up in conversation that there really wasn't a publication magazine, even a blog that seemed to cover entertaining the way that we did it with our friends. You know, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to the grocery store and pick up Martha Stewart Living and expect to find entertaining ideas that resonated with me. Like, I don't want to make the name cards. I don't want the frilly napkins. I don't want to do a centerpiece. I just want to hang out with my friends. Um, and I mean, in addition to that, even the other publications that seem to be targeting my age bracket or like my generation, seemed to be telling me that entertainment either required an enormous amount of alcohol or like a minuscule amount of clothing or like some sort of combination of the two, <laughs> which is totally fine, but like there, it's not that narrow in scope. Like we can do other things. So the kind of the, the first approach that was pivotal for us is that we needed to foco focus on making it a community. Like we needed a community with all of the contributors so that everyone felt really involved and felt like ownership was part of them. Um, part of the reason was that we didn't have startup capital. We didn't have money to infuse into this and start paying all these contributors. So we wanted them to feel like they were part of it. We launched the, the first is issue in July of 2011. And the focus at the time was really on the digital edition. So we focused on creating this uh, web platform where they could flip through the magazine. And then we did like a token print run of 500 copies, which we printed on uh, lulu.com, which uh, now is terribly embarrassing because it cost us $35 a copy, which is about 14 times more than we should have paid. And people were paying $40 per copy, but they did, they did sell. Anyways, within the first three weeks of, of launching the magazine, we had over 6 million page views. 
um, an enormous, like an overwhelmingly positive response to the magazine, which was exactly what we needed. Like we, we used this digital issue to, to test the waters, like as a guinea pig, to see like, you know, are there actually people out there that want this kind of magazine, or is it just us? But after the initial launch, um, I mean, at the same time, the same week that we launched the magazine, I had actually accepted a job and was doing training for an investment banking firm. And it was my first, first week in New York. I remember sitting in the training sessions and completely zoning out of the training and just kind of focusing in on the progress of the magazine. And two weeks after that, the, as part of the training, they told me that there was no, um, they had policies that prohibited their employees from being in public publishing outside of the, the firm. So I, I thought about it briefly, and then I just politely bowed out and said, I'm going to see how this goes with this Kinfolk magazine, and kind of jumped into that. And so with that, I felt, I kind of felt this enormous pressure that like, okay, we actually do need to do something here. Like it needs, it needs to be a legitimate magazine. It needs to have some sort of like business behind it that keeps it going. And the key for that, there's kind of three steps that we needed to take. First, we needed the proof of market. So we needed, like I said, proof that people wanted it which we had after launching it with the page views. The second is that, that we needed to somehow pitch the idea to people that we knew could help us. And we did that in kind of a, a sneaky way. Uh, we noticed that some of the copies that we were sending out of the magazine were going to like editors or people that worked at other publishers. And so it may be illegal, but we just like used their addresses and like sent them letters um, separately. Just said like, this is Kimfolk, like we're doing it. If you like what we're doing, um, we're looking for help, like we don't really know what we're doing with publishing, so reach out. Uh, and within two weeks, two publishers uh, sent us an email, they said, yeah, we love Kimfolk, like how can we help? And so the third, the third step for us was just deciding like if we actually wanted to commit and create a partnership like that, which was a little bit risky at the time, to accept their help. I should clarify that the help, the help wasn't financial, it wasn't like an infusion of capital or anything like that, it was, it was really more of a mentorship. We ultimately did decide to work with them. So it was a publisher in San Francisco, and they kind of just took us, a bunch of young college students, under their established publishing wings and, and decided to mentor us. So they taught us you know, how we should be getting it printed, not on Lulu, um, and how to work with distributors, and how to actually work in book trade and, and sell a magazine. So that for us, I mean, frankly, it was, it was not lucrative, it was actually the opposite. They were making money off of us, but for us, the decision um, was critical because we learned how to do it. Like, it was actually um, extremely practical for us. Which uh, brought us to the beginning of this year when we started publishing the magazine uh, independently. So we now do it on our own. And I guess just a quick glimpse of where we're at right now. We now um, publish it independently, we now have Three, three foreign editions and teams in um, Japan, Korea, and Russia, where they translate, print, and distribute the magazine there. We sell the magazine into 60 different markets. We work with over 600 retail accounts, like uh, Williams Sonoma, West Elm, Anthropology, that carry the magazine. Uh, by the end of this year, we will have hosted over 300 events. Those are dinners, uh, workshops, where we engage with the community actually uh, meet and talk with them around the table. And uh, kind of the bigger project for us is going into early next year, we'll be launching kind of like a, a retail product branch of the brand, which is kind of separate. So that's where we're at right now. Um, and the first, these first couple of years have been very busy for us um, and very exciting. And so it was refreshing for me to talk with Jeff on the phone and actually reminisce and go back through some of these lessons that I had found from other conferences to see which ones actually, um, actually were practical and which ones actually helped me. Actually, clarify, that's eight lessons that stuck, not suck. Um, <laughs> so lessons, lessons that have stuck with me. So these are good lessons, okay? So the first one was to fill your gaps. So this, this is really about being smart and strategic when you're hiring people. And not necessarily just for like large, uh, large creative agencies or groups, but very small scale too, like for us. If you're a photographer or some sort of creative in here, and you decide that you're going to partner with somebody to make some sort of business, maybe don't partner with another photographer. Um, maybe try and find a friend that actually has like some business skills. So they can be out finding clients and crunching the numbers and making sure you're making money while you're focusing on the creative side. 
for us, it's, we've been learning about that. We went, we went through a period where I was doing the hiring and I tend to just bring on people that I really like and I tend to like people with similar personalities, but I'm quite soft-spoken and introverted, so we went through a period where all of our planning meetings were just like, like, <laughs> like little, little, little whispers and like very little progress. And so we've, we've learned that we need a balance of extroverts and introverts and business people and creative people and the go-getters that actually just make things happen and other people that are okay just like working at the computer all day. So for example, like Asia up here in the top left, she, before joining us, she was in like competitive public speaking competitions. Like she's the most social, flamboyant girl ever. So now when anyone walks into her office, she's like the first to spin her chair around and greet them and talk to them, which really offsets like my social awkwardness. So I can just like go hide in my office and she takes care of it. Like Doug up here in the white shirt, he's, I mean, he's my closest friend, business partner. And I found that I'm, I'm quite confident, confident and comfortable explaining ideas in meetings and storyboarding them with clients and partners that we work with. But when it comes to like negotiating or swooning clients or like socializing, I'm, I'm awful and I'm usually like grumpy after 10 minutes. But Doug's awesome at that. Like he, he is aggressive when he needs to make the deal. Like he's aggressive when working with other publishers and guess what we need for the business side. And then when we need to swoon someone, he's out being all charismatic and doing that sort of thing as well. So again, it's all about like filling your gaps and creating a healthy mix. The second is to not try and please everyone. And this, this has been a really uh, interesting one for us. And again, like these are directly from my notes. We, we have a lot of positive feedback that comes in about Kinfolk, but with that, there's also kind of some negative feedback that comes in. And a lot of us are kind of softies in the office, so we have to, to learn how to, to thicken up our skin a bit. But something that we've considered is that, you know, like the, the best brands tend to, to polarize, you know? Like they're very specific about who they are and they're super specific about who they're for. And then anything that falls on the periphery, it just doesn't matter to them. A couple of examples I can think of is um, Nike. So like Nike, they are very detailed in their marketing, that they are for extremely athletic people that are really intense about, about their sport. And even if half of their sneakers are just worn to the grocery store, like, it doesn't matter, like, that's, that's who they're targeting. Another example is uh, Monocle. So Monocle magazine, uh, published out of London, they have a very specific target market of, you know, 30 to 40, 30 to 40 year old men and women, very affluent, the type that are just jet setting around the planet. They're specific about that, they do a really good job of reaching that market. But anyone that falls outside of that demographic, I can tell you absolutely hates the magazine because it comes across as super pretentious. Um, I follow the pro progress and I'll read an interview um, and below in the comments, there'll be a couple of their supporters and then a hundred that just absolutely hate the magazine, but they're doing really well. Can you guys hear me okay? A couple examples for us, uh, uh, we've been getting a lot of feedback pushing us towards kind of iPad editions and digital editions of the magazine, and so we've had to be really clear that that's, that's not something that we plan to do, and that that's maybe coming from the periphery, from people that aren't necessarily in the target readership for us. We also, believe it or not, have a lot of cat lovers that enjoy kinfolk, and so we do get feedback from them that we should be including more animals and cats in the magazine, which, which is totally fine, again, but our surveys show us that most of our readers aren't really obsessed with cats. So, we'll, so we plan to kind of toss them in here and there, and that's kind, of, that's kind of enough for our target readership. Another, on the right, we, we get feedback from, from some of our readers that the type is just too small to read, that we need to bump it up 20 points. And that, I won't make assumptions, but my, my grandma is one that does suggest that to us. And we, we have tested, and with our target readership, I mean, we're targeting young eyes. Our target readership is between 20 and 35. And so we kind of assume that that works for them. And so as a business, we don't need to make changes to kind of cater to everybody. 
And these I just grabbed on the way here. These are a couple examples of negative feedback that we can deal with. You probably can't read it, but someone talking about Kim Fook says, the fascina fascination with this aesthetic is so odd. I feel like they're trying to capture what it's like to eat dinner when you're camping, but it's so wrong. People drink like Coke from the can, and you eat some chips, and water isn't in pretty glass bottles. It's in a plastic Coleman jug from the 90s, and your mom's wearing a stretch out shirt that says Old Navy. <laughs> Another reader or hater says, I better stop at two beers or I'll get too tipsy. I might lean against the table and knock off that pile of twigs and paper flowers surrounding that $50 candle and ruin the whole aesthetic of the evening. <laughs> I can even imagine these twee bleeps dictating what their guests wear. Quote, sorry, Anna, you can't sit at our table. Your black tea and jeans don't match the Bambi-inspired forest setting of the dinner table, and you'll stand out too much in the hundred pictures I post on my blog and Instagram. <laughs> so, again, this, this isn't necessarily about like coping and dealing with negative feedback. What I'm saying is, you need to d figure out who the feedback's coming from before you decide if you should listen to it. If that was coming from our target readership, then we would probably make some adjustments and make sure we're not coming across too twee. And I should say, I have nothing against Old Navy, and I've never purchased a candle for $50. So. <laughs> and to balance that, we get sweet, sweet notes like this um, from a 12-year-old a couple weeks ago. She said, Kinfolk, yesterday I was on Pinterest and saw this pin by Mackenzie Horan, who is, let's be honest, the definition of glamorous. <laughs> of an open Kinfolk magazine, a vase of flowers, and a plate with toast. I thought this magazine was so cute, so I clicked on it and discovered Kinfolk. It's like quaint. Even the people, I want one so bad, even though I'm 12, and these are probably made for 22-year-old art majors, <laughs> because, because there's so much cool art in them. So again, stepping back, and neither of those necessarily fit within our demographic, but it's, I mean, I'm trying to imagine Kinfook is like this white horse here, okay? And so like, we, we need to keep blinders on here, and it's super important that we're open and communicating with our target readership, but it might sound harsh, like if some of those readers fall outside of our target, we have to be strong enough as a team and a company to just be like, so we're not going to do that, like we're just going to focus on our main goals here. The third, and this is where I might get a bit creepy, the third is stalk your muses or call on your muses. So this is all about finding out, finding out who really inspires you somebody within your industry, within whatever work you're doing, and uh, hanging out with them. And if you don't know them, then just kind of pretending to hang out with them. So I have this, this folder on my desktop, and this is just a screenshot of my desktop yesterday. And the folder says, Inspire Work, which is exactly what it's intended to do. And when you click into it, bam, like all of these fake friends that I have that are really inspiring to me. So there's like Margaret Howell, there's the, the founders of Muji, there's editors of different publications. So what I do is anytime I'm feeling a bit lethargic or I'm not getting a lot of work done or I don't feel super inspired, I just click into that folder and immediately it's like a, a slap in the face and like any pity party I had from working too much is completely over because I see all these other creative, really productive people, and they're working too. Like, I'm not the only one working. Like, I'll see a really established editor of a magazine, and I'll think, like, Nathan, she's doing an awesome job, and she has five kids at home. Like, you don't have any kids, so you can't really complain. Another non-criminal form of stalking that I use um, is Sagmeister Walsh. So they're a design firm in New York who I really admire. I like their work a lot. And they had this cool webcam on top of their office that shows live whatever they're doing 24 hours a day. So sometime, sometimes late in the evenings, if I'm the only one in the office working, I'll just click to their website and I'll see that a few of them are also working. But I know that does sound really lonely. <laughs> <laughs> But it works for me. So, so again, deciding within your industry who's inspiring you and just like pretend to rub shoulders with them if you can't actually meet them in real life. And this is for any industry. Like if, if you're an accountant, like I'm sure that there are really cool accountants with like snazzy <laughs> spreadsheet tricks. The fourth was go deep, not broad. So this is similar to the blinders, but more specifically about what you're proactively deciding to do yourself. 
So for us, Kinfolk, we are a casual, entertaining magazine for young adults. Like, that's it. Like, that's what we want to do really well. So it's about us just focusing on that and not getting distracted by a hundred other things. Similarly, like anyone working in a creative field or any field, like I had a friend who for a while his signature would say, so-and-so, photographer, graphic designer, stylist. And anytime I saw that, like I felt like I needed to tell him, like maybe just stick to one. You know, like maybe just market yourself as one and do it really well. It's the whole idea of, you know, being a jack of all trades and a master of none. Like let's, let's pick a trade and, and do it really well. Or let's pick a project like a magazine and just really focus on trying to do that really well. Example of some, some distractions for us is we, we receive feedback from, from readers that, that they want kinfolk weddings. Like they want weddings in the magazine. And we just kind of shake our heads like, mm, that's not really us right now. Like we want to focus on casual entertaining. We get feedback from them that they want more foodie material, like they want more celebrity chefs in it. And we just kind of go, mm, you know, like we've got Bon Appetit, we've got Savoir, like there's others doing that. We just want to do casual entertaining. Or we get feedback that we need more uh, children, you know, entertaining ideas for kids. And I'm totally for that, um, but maybe not for kinfolk, um, because our surveys show that 90% of our readers don't have kids yet, so that's something that we're going to wait on. The fifth is to create the master list. Uh, and so this is something that I read in a book called Getting Things Done. And the whole idea is that you need to create a system outside of your brain where you can just keep track of everything work-related. Something that allows you, like any task, anyone you need to call, um, anything you need to think about, you just write on there so that it doesn't remain in your head and just clog things up. So this, I mean, this is a snapshot that I took on the plane over here of my master list. And so, and I, censored, I made sure that there's nothing inappropriate in there. Um, and it starts, I have a column for general to do, I have a column for less urgent, a column for soon, and everything kind of trickles up to the top where it's immediate. And so when I start the day, I kind of organize things, and then I'm working through the immediates. Below, I have a column for, for everybody on our team. So at the start of the day, my, day, I try and look at what tasks and things I need to do, and then consider which things could maybe be delegated to someone else, or which things someone else might be better suited for. I then move it down to their column, and then chat with them about it. Uh, another little trick I use is uh, often time myself. So on my iPhone. Um, I don't know if anyone can relate, but if you run your own business or if uh, you're an illustrator, a photographer, there's no one really there to crack a whip or set the hours for you. Sometimes it can feel like you have you know, an endless amount of time to work, which usually means that you start working through into the evenings. Um, and so I try and create a sense of urgency for myself. I'll just decide which task I'm going to do within an hour and then hit the timer and then it's go time. I've got an hour to get it done and it kind of creates this fake sense of yeah, urgency. The sixth is to kill with kindness. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure why, why we've been doing this, but I think in business, we're all familiar with like a competitive strategy, like looking at the market, seeing what everyone's doing, figuring out what they're not doing, and then trying to do that as the competitive advantage. And as, as we've been starting in publishing, we're really new to it, um, but it has felt a bit cutthroat and a little bit competitive between other publications. So we just decided as a team that we were going to try being nice. Um, and so a few things that we do for that, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, everyone on our team, we have like kinfolk letterpress cards. We all have to write a, a card, a letter to somebody that we've been working with. It could be a, a contributor, a reader, somebody that we've just exchanged an email with. We have to actually write them a note, and then those stack of cards go out three times a week. Another thing has been, Figuring out how to express, uh, another thing for me has been learning how to express appreciation within the team. Uh, we have a gal who plans all of the dinners, and we had some guests coming from Japan a couple weeks ago, and she already had uh, like 25 events that she was coordinating for the month, and we just said, hey, Julie, do you mind just planning another event for these, these guests that are coming? There'll be about 40 of us there, and she took it on herself, and she did it, and it turned out fantastic like that. But the day after at work, I, I felt like sheepish, like I couldn't actually 
express gratitude for what she'd done because I felt like she'd just roll her eyes at me because we'd been giving her so much work. So I just casually thanked her for the dinner and told her it turned out really good. But a couple weeks after, I t or a week after, I talked to her and it was like this burden on her. Like she was planning all these events so often and like she just didn't, she felt like a complete failure. Like no one was really appreciating it within the office because I had been too timid to, to say anything. And so now I just absolutely gush. Like I, anything in the office, like I'm trying to really like ex express how much I appreciate it. And I found that like two, two really simple ways that help that is by being specific and by using third party compliments. So real quick, um, being specific, an example would be, you know, like if I wrote an editor's letter um, and 10 people complimented me on that letter, most of them would probably be like, oh, that was a great letter, like, good job on the letter. And those are heartwarming, and I'm not going to discredit that, um, but maybe one of those people would say, that was a great editor's letter, especially that last sentence where you talked about making the magazine more readable, because it really showed that you were listening to your readers. That one compliment, I'm going to actually remember. The other nine, I appreciate, but I probably won't remember. So I'm trying to make things more specific. And third-party compliments, that might come across a little sneaky, but when you're wanting to compliment someone, you just express the appreciation or compliment to someone you know will tell that person. Um, so a friend or if two people in the office are super chatty and you know they always talk about it, tell the other how much you appreciate their work, and it's pretty sh certain that it'll be passed on to the other person. And I know, I know, as long as it's honest and sincere. <laughs> For me personally, if a compliment ever comes indirectly from a third party like that, it just feels so much more meaningful. Well, yeah, it just does feel more meaningful. <laughs> the seventh is to honor your working style. So. This is just about figuring out how the environment in which you work best and then honoring that, like actually being okay with that and being open with other people that that's how you work best. So for me, I mean, we, we re rearranged our office so that it was very communal, very open, very creative, how we kind of assumed things were supposed to be. And it just did not work for me. Like I mentioned, I tend to work in kind of an introverted environment. I like, I like it quiet. Um, I don't like a ton of noise around me. And so I finally just accepted that and kind of moved into this closet-sized office there, which has been working fantastic. I have this introverted cocoon over here that I just go in um, into silence. I also learned that I'm much better at presenting things and sharing ideas when I have time to kind of go off on my own, research it, think about it, create kind of a visual presentation and then share it versus kind of off the cuff discussions and brainstorming meetings. So I've accepted that that's actually okay. Like that's how I work best. So we'll have a meeting and then I'll just ask if I can kind of take off for 20, 30 minutes. And I feel like I come back with better ideas doing that. And the eighth and last is to swim in wild water, which I don't necessarily mean literally. Um, this, this is about just finding a balance for you um, or whatever makes you feel a sense of balance, like a, a place of, of like refuge where you feel like you're able to re-energize and recharge. For me, it actually is like swimming in water. We have a river right by our house, and so during the summer, every evening, I try and actually just get in the water because that's when I feel like my mind is actually cleared and I can think clearly for the next day. But I have friends whose method is running, or it's tennis. I have a friend who, uh, their method is World of Warcraft in the evenings. Like, that works for them. Uh, another who does tribal belly dancing. So like, whatever, whatever space you can get into that actually allows you to, to kind of clear your mind, say, to, to figure that out and then do it frequently. So just in summary, filling your gaps, don't try and please everyone. Stock your, muse, your muses, go deep, not broad, create the master list, kill with kindness, honor your working style, and swim in wild waters. These, these are notes that I found going through my notebooks that have actually worked for me and they've stuck. They're, 
to something that I've integrated and that feel really good and have got me in a good rhythm. And one, one that I didn't mention on there, but that I've stolen from a friend who's an illustrator, he has a poster above his desk that says, too blessed to be stressed, which, I, I mean, it might sound a bit sappy, but for me, I, I feel very fortunate to be doing something that I love. Like, I, I really, really enjoy working on Kinfolk, and I feel very fortunate to be working with creative minds around me that, that I love. And so for me, it seems insane and crazy to allow myself to stress out all the time. I feel like I'm always going to be having tasks and things to do and places to go, and my nature is to get stressed and to get worked up about it. But I'm trying to remind myself with that little sticker, too blessed to be stressed, that I do actually need to stop realize that this is actually like a blessing to be doing this, and I just need to like chill and enjoy it. Um, and within that vein, kind of thinking about you guys as well, consider the amount of time and hours that we're all going to be putting into our careers and the work that we, cho that we choose. I did like a quick calculation on my iPhone before I came up, and just, just like the minimum, like 8 to 5, Monday to Friday, retire at 65, that works out to close to 100 100,000 hours. That's like, you know, like an hour sitting here, and then another hour, and then times 100,000. Um, so, obviously. <laughs> so, I guess, thinking, thinking about that, it just seems like such a shame and a crime if we're all going to dedicate that much time to our careers if they don't feel right for us, or if they don't feel like they're fulfilling, or if they're contributing to society. Um, so I guess it's my hope, in conclusion, that we can all think about that and make sure that we're willing to make that commitment and dedicate that amount of hours to whatever we're doing. And my hope would be that if something doesn't feel right, that we do have the courage to make changes, to take leaps and to take risks, to make sure that it does. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Okay, so a lot of people want to replicate your brand now, but I don't think that you would um, encourage that. The question is, who is your audience and how do you best communicate to them? So do you have any tips related to finding your niche for the work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, for, for us, it was really, I mean, honestly, for months we had kind of an identity crisis, like who are we actually trying to reach? And that just required us to just make the decision. Like we decided that our target reach is going to be 20 to 35 year olds. Here's going to be some of their interests. Here's the tone that they talk, like this is how they talk with their friends. And then we kind of crafted the magazine around that to make sure that it, it caters to that demographic. So similarly, I mean, even if, if you're an illustrator deciding like what kind of clients and people you want to reach and then actually like making notes and like sticking it on your wall that like, that's who I'm trying to reach. This is the method that I'm going to use to get to them. Hmm. And then, again, like using the blinders to just focus on that. That's great. Thank you, Nathan.